the geography of the city. It's complicated. Johannesburg is made up of neighborhoods that are divided by freeways. Some of these neighborhoods are extremely upscale, some are informal settlements that have become towns and townships. During the apartheid era and before, maps of Johannesburg would omit some of these neighborhoods and were just not labeled at all. I've learned a lot more about where I'm from just from skating in the streets and meeting people who live in Joburg than I ever would have imagined. Skating in the city, you're not just driving in your car past different spots and seeing people, it's, you're actually skating, you're getting involved. It's still very unsafe for young kids to be walking around or playing in the streets, so we would always find ways to get out of the house to go and skateboard on the streets. I was born in 1982. I grew up just at the end of apartheid. What my parents tried to do for me and my sisters was instill a great sense of independence and strength in us. Um, Tembisa was a very violent time. Sometimes we couldn't even go home. I'd have to sleep over at a friend's house because it was too dangerous for me to travel home. There was these hectic gangsters and they were called the toasters. And they drove around in the car and if you were walking with your friends, they just take you in the car and they, you'd disappear for weeks. Your parents wouldn't be able to find you. Um, and then they'd spend hours and hours, weeks on weeks, raping you and then release you. And then all of a sudden, you'd be like back on the streets. And everyone knew who they were, but those were the challenges that girls faced. It took a very long time for that system of the toasters to get out of the hood. And even now, I'm not even sure if they're completely out of the hood. Patriarchy in South Africa continues today. Uh, we, we have a, a strong history of kind of traditional patriarchy in South Africa and we also have the same kinds of patriarchal challenges that you would see all over the world in coming together to make sure that women have kind of bear multiple oppressions. They would bear the oppression of sexism, they bear the oppression of traditional religion, they bear the oppression of uh, class discrimination and race discrimination in the case of, of black South African women. And they, they come together to, to limit the way in which young women can find voice, can find space in South Africa today. In a place like South Africa, there's a lot of violence against women, there's a lot of stereotypes in terms of what what women can do and what they can't do and that can be broken. Our skate school in Johannesburg is totally an opportunity for people to rethink what what girls can do. Maybe we need to challenge some of these stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Oliver and Ayanda actually, when they first came here, they wanted to start programs straight away. So they were looking for places in Johannesburg where they could start and they found this ball in Troyville. It was the first outreach location. And they cleaned up the ball. It was just filled of craziest things you could ever imagine. I started volunteering then. They had been running it for a few, few weeks and I came in and we painted the ball and we just started sessions straight away from there.
if you look at a project like Skaterstan with kids that are living in different conditions, or very poor conditions. Women and men always have different standards towards each other. That's just the way it goes. This is worldwide. Skateboarding is something that maybe in the Western world, lots of women won't start doing, mostly because it's always been male-dominated and they feel weird going in and just hanging out with all these guys. You know, you can't just skate, you also have to deal with only dudes. It's a barrier, but here, the girls and the guys both, they need something to do, they're bored. Skateboarding is something to do, and it's fun, and it's scary, and if you land it, in the end you learn something, you believe in yourself. You have this moment that you just did a trick that you didn't know how to do before. If those kids get that feeling, they also feel like they've achieved something all by themselves. There's a lot of ways to shoot photos. For me, it's a moment. It's like a certain thing that catches my attention in a certain moment, and it just happens. You're dealing with people, you're dealing with other people's lives. It's bigger than yourself. And if you do something bigger than yourself, it will just inspire other people and will have other people's attention. Black Sash was a very important organisation in the anti-apartheid struggle. Nelson Mandela called us the conscience of white South Africa. There were some white middle class women who decided that they didn't like what was happening in the country. And for myself, I realised that if I didn't stand up and actually protest against apartheid, the apartheid government would be seen to be doing things in my name. I didn't want them to assume I was condoning what was happening. The way I got into taking photographs was actually, you know, because of, of my membership of the Black Sash and because of seeing what was happening in rural areas in particular, I felt that that lifestyle needed to be documented so that people couldn't say they didn't know what was happening. And that's how then I got pulled into the townships and what was happening in the townships. Quite often a lot of it was around funerals of people who had been shot by the police. The protests in the townships inclined it to be fairly violent and under the states of emergency in 1985 and 1986, thousands of people were, were detained. And what detention means is that it's not you are arrested, but you never know how long you are going to be in prison. I was arrested a few times, but sort of in a group of people. The night that they detained me, which was in July, it was actually June 1986. In fact, I kept remembering all the young people, and including a 12-year-old boy who had actually been put in with adults. He became my inspiration because I thought if he can do it, then I can do it. We are really lacking a unified women's organization in South Africa today. We have more poor now than we did under apartheid. We remain one of the most unequal societies in the world. And it's women who bear the brunt for managing that on a day-to-day -day basis. You strike the woman, you strike the rock. You have struck the woman, you have struck the rock. That comes from that amazing struggle song that was sung on that fateful day in 1956 when those 20,000 women came together in that citadel of apartheid, Pretoria, to challenge the anti-pass laws being extended to African women. We've located history within a very particular kind of paradigm of the past is the past. Why do we need to know about what happened then? But the reality is, is those women from the past could serve as such incredible examples for what young women today could be doing in order to take control and forward their own rights.
been waiting for about two years now for the skate school to open. We ran into a whole lot of problems in the beginning, but I think the last year has been really awesome building the facility. Like you can see from when there was just nothing in that piece of land to a few months later having a whole skate school. It's been, been amazing, but a long way, it's worth it all. It's incredibly exciting. Every single time you're just sitting on a computer, typing emails and doing this and you just think it's never going to come together and you just have one problem after another and then all of a sudden you're in this totally incredible place that has so much potential for the next maybe even 50 years. It's sort of all dawning on me like wow it's actually here, it's actually happening. You guys ready to get us started? The first skate school in South Africa, Skate Star. The opening of the skate school which was super successful and so exciting. I've been having like skateboarding daydreams and thinking and wishing we had a skate park in Johannesburg since almost 20 years ago. <laughs> still a, a stigma about girl skating that, that is hard to overcome because it's so deep rooted in, in, in skate culture and surf culture as well. So um, I love that there are girls shaking up, disrupting that idea and, and taking upon themselves to be the catalyst for change. I think uh, especially when you're talking about getting youth involved in these projects with, with Skatistan, from the very ground level they already know that there are as many girls as boys skating and, and that they can both coexist and inspire each other and um, I, I love it. I love that it's in the most unlikely places too, like Afghanistan, like South Africa, like Cambodia. South Africa, we are the highest women who are being abused. Some pieces of legislation, they favor the perpetrators rather than favoring the victim themselves. This is what we want to advocate, you know, as women, that we need to do some amendments in some of the acts that are affecting women. This project, it's a wonderful project, coming together as a rainbow nation, this is what I see inside. We're trying to, to teach our future leaders. Allowing both boys and girls to mingle. Allow them to see themselves as equal in society. Are you surprised that girls are skateboarding? Very surprised. I think that is only for men, but now I can see that there is a lot of challenges, which means that women also they are being involved in these things. Anything that a woman can do, even a man can do it. Even a woman, what a man can do, a woman can do it. This project was possible thanks to The Skate Room. It's a social enterprise that works with huge contemporary artists such as Ai Weiwei and Paul McCarthy. On the opening day, we got a huge surprise. Paul McCarthy delivered a life-size statue of Barack Obama in socks, holding up a skateboard as a shield. Paul and his son Damon created a series of limited edition skateboards that are sold all over the world to raise money for Skaterstan. These artists show us how vital it is to confront the established order. What we want for all of our students, for them to believe in themselves. And there's no way that you've got to have confidence in your ideas, no matter how crazy they are, to make them, to make them a reality. If you do believe in them, it doesn't matter how zany they are, you can make it work. If you're passionate about it, you can do it. I believe that skateboarding is the most powerful object of change in the world.
Skatistan is a, is a great agent of change for bringing forth more women in skating. You look at um, their program in Afghanistan, where 40% of the skaters are women, and I think that um, you just keep building on that. Where in Afghanistan, the skateboarding is totally new, so it's all about just learning something new. Where maybe in Johannesburg, it's, it's about learning that you can actually become incredibly good at it, as good as the boys. All those different levels of learning, it just becoming a better thing. I think that's a really special thing about skateboarding is that people that are quite different all of a sudden have a common bond. All of a sudden there's a trust there that is, can be built so fast just because I skateboard and you skateboard. When I was about 10, my cousins were into skateboarding and I was always like, I can do this, like I want to get a skateboard and my parents bought me a skateboard for Christmas. Well, my cousins were going down this huge hill and I was like, I can do it. And they were like, I can't do this, go away. And I cruised down past all of them. And yeah, ever since then I was like, no way, this is, I want to skate forever. Before you start anything with whichever group, we do like uh, classroom rules and skate rules and the children get to suggest their own rules on what they want and then we start working from there. The important one was to respect each other's spaces. Once an individual feels safe, they're able to express themselves and be more creative and that also allows for growth. We want girls to be able to be as confident as boys in whatever it is that they're doing. We're hoping that by saying girls only sessions, we can increase the number of girls that come to our sessions so that we have an equal number of participants at the mixed gender sessions so that we're seeing more girls skateboarding and becoming more confident and confident in their own abilities and confident to interact with boys and not be sidelined and take the teasing and push back as hard as they're getting. When I skate, I feel like I'm releasing some, sp some stress, when I'm feeling a bit stressed. And after skating, I feel much better. And skating makes me feel like a princess. And what is a princess like? She lives in a castle and she does anything she wants. We make sure that one of our staff is comprised of females so that girls can see that look it's not just boys who are on the skateboards not just your older brothers who are on skateboards there's girls who are doing this and they're good at it and you can be just as good I think that in skateboarding, it's good if you learn it young, you learn that falling is all a part of it and you can take that into your life and realize that failure doesn't really mean failure, it means that you're learning. So I think that's good for a young person to learn. Girls should believe that they can do whatever they want. It's as simple as that. And if we can instill that in one girl, we can instill it in 20 girls. And if we can instill that in 20 girls, then we're doing the right thing. If the Department of Education can make in schools that people, that teachers, that respect women, regardless of whether she's black or white, heterosexual, lesbian or transgender, Kelly. Hindu or Christian or Muslim, then we can work together collectively as a nation in order to overcome all forms of gender-based violence in society. Okay.